Thank you for joining us. Hello and welcome to Covering the Pandemic, Photographers on the Front Lines from the Earth Institute at Columbia University in partnership with Magnum Photos. I'm Dale Willman, joining you from the North Country of upstate New York. I'm a longtime radio and photojournalist. I spent many years in Washington, D.C., working for NPR, CBS, and CNN. I recently spent a year in South Sudan working with radio journalists and trainers. For decades, I've also traveled the world to teach journalists how to better inform the communities about significant issues. And right now, few issues are more significant or immediate than the pandemic and its aftermath. And I forgot to do the very first thing you do in a webinar. Can everybody hear me okay? Excellent, okay. The purpose of this conversation is several. First, it's to provide important information for photojournalists in the field on how best to stay safe. It's also to raise the issue of trauma within the journalism community and to provide tools for dealing with that. And finally, it's about community. And this is an important one for me, particularly when you're in the field working alone and you have no one who understands what you do and why you do it, you can feel very isolated. Fostering a conversation among photojournalists then as we are today, I hope will help to reduce those feelings of isolation you may feel and let you know that you are not alone. For a little bit at least, I hope this becomes your community. And speaking of community, I want to say that several prominent photographers have lost their lives to the coronavirus. One of the most recent to be announced is Theodore Gaffney, who photographed the Freedom Riders early in the civil rights movement in America. He died on Easter Sunday. If we could take just a brief moment to honor those we've lost, photographers, family members, and others. All right, thank you for that. I'll introduce our guests in just a moment, but first to the matter of questions. Today's format is mostly a conversation among several highly acclaimed photojournalists, and you'll more than likely have questions for them. So get a piece of paper and a pencil if you could, because I'm gonna give you some information here about questions. Here's how we're going to handle that. I've turned off the comments on Zoom, it's a useful tool, but it's difficult to keep track of questions that are being asked. So instead, we're using onlinequestions.org. So that's onlinequestions.org. And now you need to write down this particular piece of information. When you go to onlinequestions.org, you need to enter this code, 2020-0420. It's basically today's date, 2020-0420. 20. The interesting thing about using this and the reason I like it so much is that rather than Zoom and other platforms where the questions just, just scroll by and it's hard to keep track of them, here you not only write your own questions, but you can also like questions. And those that get the most likes ride to the top. They're easier for the moderator to see. It indicates a lot of interest in that particular question. So I encourage you to ask questions, but also if you see something you think is important that you want answered, be sure and like it. Also, we have an honor system here. We have uh, students, other people joining us. I'd like the first questions to be for journalists. So if you are a journalist, would you put journalist first and then write your question? And I hope we can go by the honor system there. And that way we'll be able to answer, answer uh, ask journalist questions first. And now to our guests, this is truly an international program today. And I'm immensely grateful for Magnum and all the work they've done to help us with this. Judith Matloff is not a professional photographer that I know of, at least not uh, 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 in terms of what we're talking about here. She teaches crisis reporting at Columbia's Graduate School of Journalism. She trailblazed safety training for women and media organizations around the world, helping hundreds of journalists survive an increasingly dangerous world. And I've seen her do trainings and she's incredible. I'm grateful to have her with us. She spent more than 40 years as a journalist and has covered top international stories, including Rwanda's genocide, apartheid, and the rise of Vladimir Putin. She's also the author of the forthcoming book about staying safe. You should all get a copy of this when it's available, How to Drag a Body and Other Safety Tips You Hope You'll Never Need. It's a great title. It's available soon. Judith will join us later in the program to discuss trauma and how to address it. We'll also be joined later in the program by Lauren Winfield, a contact director of, from Magnum, and Natalie Ivis, also with Magnum, and we'll in, introduce them more then. And now to the photographers. At the age of 15, Alex Majoli joined the F45 studio in Ravenna, working alongside Danielle Casadio. While studying at the Art Institute in Ravenna, he joined the Grazia Neri Agency and traveled to Yugoslavia to document the conflict there. He returned many times over the next few years, covering all major events in Kosovo and Albania. 
He's joining us from Italy, where he's been covering the pandemic for Vanity Fair. As soon as he shows up, I'd like to get to him in case he has to leave quickly. Thomas Dvorak has documented many of this century's most important news stories since the 1990s. Dvorak started traveling when he was 16 to photograph conflicts in Northern Ireland, Israel, Palestine, and the disintegrating Yugoslavia. Since then, he's gone on to photograph wars in Afghanistan and Iraq post 9-11, the revolutions in the former Soviet republics of Georgia, Kyrgyzstan, and Ukraine. He'll join us in a few minutes from Paris. Brian Woolston is a, photog a photojournalist based in Louisville, Kentucky. He covers news, sports, and politics for the Associated Press, Reuters Pictures, and Getty Images. Brian is also preparing for the launch of his nonprofit, Journey Press. It's an organization that will specialize in telling the stories of humanitarian-focused nonprofits around the world. Here's where it gets interesting with Brian. Brian spent 20 years in the United States Army, where he trained as an explosive ordnance disposal tech. His duty assignments included multiple tours in Iraq, Afghanistan, and other high and low intensity areas of operation around the world. He finished his military career with duties assigned to the United States Secret Service and the presidential and vice presidential protection detail in Washington, D.C. So he brings a very interesting perspective to this conversation. Henri Kanaj has been a freelance photographer for major publications such as Time, Lightbox, CNN Photo, New York Magazine, MSNBC Photography, Wall Street Journal, Courier International, and many other outlets. He was born in Tirana, Albania in 1980. He spent his early childhood there and moved with his family to Greece in 1991, immediately after the opening of the borders. He's based in Athens and covers stories in Greece and the Balkans. He joins us from Greece. And Nusha Tavakolian is a self-taught photographer. She began working professionally in the Iranian press at the age of 16 at women's daily newspaper Zan. At the age of 18, she was the youngest photographer to cover the 1999 student uprising, which was a turning point for the country's blossoming reformist movement and for Nusha personally as a photojournalist. In 2003, she started working internationally covering the war in Iraq. She's known for her powerful work covering wars in Iraq and social issues in her native Iran. And she joins us today from Iran. Nusha, I'd like to start with you, if I could, please. First, thank you very much for joining us. Can you tell us exactly where you are right now? Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm also very happy I could join this uh, conversation. I'm in Tehran. I'm at my studio in Tehran right now. So have you done coverage of the pandemic? I understand you have been out in the streets for some coverage of this. Yes. So um, we have to know this, that Iran was one of the first country that was hit by the virus. So at the early March, um, Iran was, uh, we all went to self-isolation because um, the uh, virus uh, starts spreading all over the country very quickly because in that time it was election time, parliamentary election, and also the 40, um, 41st um, anniversary of the revolution. So many people, they went on the street and uh, they got the virus. So, um, and then the hospitals, they could not manage to um, uh, accept all the patients and then people uh, themselves, they decided to do self uh, isolation and they went on quarantine. And um, in that time, still the government, they were not um, uh, realizing what is happening. Oh, many people here, they believe they knew, but because they knew they cannot stop and they don't have the resources to um, uh, um, uh, receive uh, all the patients that they need the care. Um, so they um, decided to um, not um, send the news out. So tell me what it's like being on the street during this time. Uh, you bring particular um, things of interest as a woman on the streets of Iran, but also at time of pandemic. What can you tell me about that? And, and what, what, tell me what it's like being on the street and what you do to keep yourself safe. Yes. So um, you said as a woman, you know, I, I live here and all my life I lived in Iran. So when it comes to something like the coronavirus and the pandemic, I don't really... Um, see myself as a you know women photographer going on street you know I, I look at myself like all the other humans here 
Um, what happened here that uh, I have a really um, weak lungs and I have asthma. So I had to be really careful uh, by not getting the virus. So I was very conscious and I was in, in quarantine for two, three weeks when National Geographic, they um, uh, contacted me and they asked me if I can do a story about what is happening in Iran. Um, I had to think about it because um, it was exactly at the same time where it was the death anniversary of my father and my mother, she prepared a, a big anniversary for, for, for my father with lots of guests and lots of people coming from all around Iran to visit uh, um, my family and we all had to go to the graveyard. So we had to cancel everything. And then I I decided that instead of going on street, because um, what happened, I was looking at my colleagues' images and it was quite difficult to cover the virus here in Iran because you could not take pictures freely. And um, at the hospitals, you have to have the permission and they would take you to specific places. So you could not cover um, the, the pandemic as freely, you know, as other countries. It was, um, um, it was very sensitive topic at first. And I um, decided to um, do a personal essay um, on self-isolation, on, on quarantine, because I thought that um, maybe later many other countries, they will go through what we are going through through right now. So it's better to show them in um, quarantine what's happening to you and your surroundings. So I decided to cover the, the pandemic in, in a quite um, um, first person um, essay. And how have you done that? What, what, what does that look like in images? So um, um, in images like the, the image that it was uh, published um, in, in National Geographic. Um, I, first of all, I wrote the story, so it's first-person story. Um, I explain uh, how it is as a photographer to leave the house, uh, to go out and take pictures, because at first I went out to take pictures, but then after five days, I decided decided not to go out um, and do more your quarantine, how you see as a photographer, you know, your surroundings, you, you give more attention to details, to, to slowness of life and to things that you never uh, really um, gave your attention to. And um, I've started the article with, um, with uh, explaining how it feels uh, to put a mask on because as a photographer, it's quite a difficult time uh, actually to be a photographer because um, you go out and, um, and one of the uh, places that you can get the virus is your eyes. So you go out and you are outside taking pictures with the gloves, with the mask. When your mask is on, when you put the camera on your eye, there is like a, um, a kind of, um, um, you cannot see uh, very sharply. And then when you take the mask out, many people here in, in Iran, they don't really take the social distance quite serious. So they come very close. So it was quite challenging. And uh, the street at first, it was full of people. Lots of people were there because it was also our Iranian New Year. Uh, 28th of March was Iranian New Year. So many people, they wanted to do shopping, buy gifts, and it's like Christmas, you know, in the West. But um, what happened that um, um, suddenly the virus, uh, it became um, the government decided to impose the quarantine on, 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 on people. And uh, the problem was also with Iranians here was that when the government imposed the quarantine, they have to provide people with first need and with food, with water, with mask and with gloves, with um, with um, you know so many other first need that you need inside your house. But because of the economical 
the economic problem here that we are facing in Iran, um, the government could not do that. So they could not impose the quarantine more than one week here. I'm, I'm, and you, you've touched on this a little bit, but I'm still, I'm, I'm interested in your, in your, in your, in your personal motivation here, given the asthma, given the, 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 the added risk that places you in, and yet you feel compelled to be out there doing this. And you've touched on it a little bit more, but is there anything you can expand on that? I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by that element of it. Um, how can I say that? You know, it's, it's, it's my job. I mean, when there is something like the virus, this pandemic, I cannot just sit at home and say like, like um, the, um, I, of course, I take the safety measurement, but it's my job and not only my job, it's, it's what I do and, and what I'm doing for the past 23 years. So it's kind of like it's in my vein that, you know, to every time there is something that I also maybe not necessarily go to the front line, you know, like many other photographers that they, they did, they had the opportunity, they went to hospitals, they went to graveyards where they would bury the, uh, the, the people who died uh, because of coronavirus. But because of my um, health issue, I decided, okay, maybe it's interesting uh, to look into this, um, what is happening now in a very personal way way and um, like like I can explain to you I live in a, a 26 floor building in east of Tehran sorry in west of Tehran and we have so many different kind of people living at the same building old people younger generation younger people a single people with just newborn kids and um, so it was quite interesting to also show the life of these people who live in my building. Like at first, um, uh, we have a grocery store next to the building. Uh, the people who work at the grocery, they would come and they would deliver the grocery shops. But then the building, they decided they're no longer uh, going to allow anyone from outside of the building to and enter all our building. So um, go and take the grocery shop and deliver it to people. And at first nobody would use mask, but then after some days, one by one, people they would um, uh, wear masks and gloves and um, take the distance. And if I was in an elevator, by myself without a mask, um, uh, people who were in other, they were in other floor, they wanted to join the, um, the elevator, they would not come in because they would be scared. Like if I have Corona, I can give it to them. And, um, and then I started to um, going to, to my house and see what I can photograph. So I became more interested in a morning light and, and the, the, the things that I have in the house and, and my cats and, and the, the flowers in my house that the, after one week they would be rotten and, and the fruits and um, yeah, life, it became kind of slow. And uh, if you can see, uh, go to the National Geographic website and see my story and my images, you see there is not much happening. It's very slow. And and when uh, I went with my mother and my sister, at the end, we decided to go to the graveyard for the anniversary uh, of the death of my father. Um, it was such a um, stressful trip because uh, my sister, um, at first, she was not believing Corona. She was like, no, this is all uh, and I don't know she was watching so much um, um, I don't know like TV this is not so she was like into that mood and she was not wearing gloves so she went outside of a car to buy flowers for the graveyard of my father and me and my mother we were so scared and we start shouting so it was such a stressful um, trip to go and come back and and since then I think our life uh, really changed enormously and it, the, 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 the sad part is like we all kind of get to use to live like this way. 
A quick, uh, quick point of reference. Do you live alone or are you coming home to people that, that if you were to become infected, that, that you might, that that's a risk? Yeah, so um, I live uh, by, I live uh, in this uh, building that I live, I live by my husband, uh, with my husband, but my husband was not here at first. He joined me later and again he left. Um, and uh, my mother and my sister, they live one street higher from my building. So um, most of the day I spend my time with my mother and my sister. And my worry was uh, mostly um, that if I go out and take pictures, if I get corona, because I, I see my mother every day, I can give it to her. And also that was, um, uh, you know, uh, one of was one of my concern and I was so careful but uh, unfortunately at the end I got corona and um, I just feel much better uh, with like in the past two days um, I had a very mild corona luckily it didn't hit my lungs so um, and um, um, it passed the uh, I passed the two weeks of um, pain in my chest and coughing so I feel much better but you can not you can, even if you're careful you know it can happen so that's the problem with coronavirus you never know how you can get well I'm grateful that you're okay uh, you've raised some issues about covering this in a different way that does not require going out in the streets. So I want to come back to the discussion of being on the streets. But Thomas Dvorak is with us, and he's uh, uh, in Paris. Thomas, are you out there? I saw you a minute ago. I'm sorry, I was late. Sir. Oh, no worries. So just make sure you're still mm -hmm. with us. Okay. Uh, so so uh, you may have heard Nusha talking a little bit about what she's done Um uh, uh, in covering this from uh, uh, a different perspective. And you've done that as well. You've made a choice not to go out in the street, which is difficult for many photographers because you kind of have to be at these places to be able to take these photographs, but you found a, a different way of documenting this. Can you talk a bit about that? Well, I'm still struggling with it. So I, say, I don't have a, the, the ultimate answer to it, but, um... I think, um, I mean, it's a little, I mean, I have, I've like listening to a new show or like I talked to Alex before and everything. I think it's, 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 it's like, I'm very happy there's all this work going on. And I think what I'm doing should not be, it would be horrible if I was the only one who was uh, like, if I was the, uh, sort of the way I chose to do it would be the only one, or the only way we could deal with this. And uh, so I've, I come from a very documentary tradition. I've always, been out there. I mean, I've never, uh, never taken it as like ex to such an extreme. But uh, with the Corona crisis now, I very early I somehow felt that when I was out there, it was almost like my from my egotism. I wasn't I wasn't really getting anything. I, it was it was amazing to be in the streets of Paris. It was empty. I was biking around. I was taking kind of weird pictures of people with masks. But I felt it doesn't really do anything, and um, like it doesn't add anything or so. And uh, so I thought I should turn it all around and I decided to stay at home. So I don't, just to be clear, I don't have to stay at home. I can go out, I have a pass, I have a press pass, I have all the, I mean, I could do it. And uh, I have no, I'm not in quarantine. I mean, it sounds, would sound a little bit more dramatic, I guess, if I could say so, but it's not. And, um, but I chose, I decided that I would like to try to photograph this entire other world that has come up, which is like, like we're doing right now. I mean, I should take pictures now, actually, it's like the, Sort of the Zoom world, and uh, so it's, mo it's mostly Zoom. Part of it is uh, I've done a little bit of WhatsApp, and uh, and a little bit of uh, Skype. But Zoom is sort of the most most inconvenient one, and what makes me the most like most it's the most satisfying as a photographer. So I haven't really, I mean, it's still I'm still trying to work with it. So. I think I made a few mistakes at the beginning when I was very uh, active um, trying to bring people together. I and mean, Nusha, I remember calling Nusha and then we tried to get somebody from China on the phone and sort of create these weird situations with a show me your life, but it wasn't visually, it really wasn't interesting. So what I've, done, what I've done since is I was trying to kind of duplicate what I used to do as, a, well, used to do, I hope I'll do it again, but uh, used to do as a, as a real photographer so that I would go so all these kind of different roles. So one would be the protocol photographer that's allowed into a political event where you take, you have two minutes to take a picture of 50 seconds or whatever, 30 seconds. 
and then you go out and then there's the front stage there's the backstage there are the i don't know the the, the sort of more social things but also mostly by getting myself into zoom calls so in, into existing ones so i'm trying to join religious um religious well, there's a lot of religious services family parties nightclub whatever whatever there is and uh, so now in the last few few weeks maybe i've tried to also shift in a way that i would use that tool in order to photograph things i cannot get to it's not because i'm not there it's not because i'm not because literally nobody should go there so it's about people who are living in confinement or people who are in in quarantine so i'm now photographing in a house for the elderly where the the staff has has um has quarantined with the with the uh, with the the residents for about four weeks now so there is no way i mean even if i drive up there they're not going to let me in because i put them in danger so i'm trying to work my way around this i don't know i hope it's going to work so Thomas, I'm, I'm going to interrupt here for a moment simply because Alex has joined us and I know that uh, uh, he's working on, on the streets in Italy and, and uh, may only have limited time with us. But uh, I'll come back to you in a moment and uh, uh, Brian and, and Rhea as well. But Alex, uh, can you hear me? Are you there? Hello, Alex. Let me see if, uh, if I can find you again and unmute you. Hang on a second. There you go. Hi, Alex. You hear me? I do. Glad to have you join us. Can you tell me where you are right now and, and what you're working on? Um, I'm, uh, I keep uh, is more about uh, Eastern West. I'm Bergamo. Yesterday I was in Venice. Alex, I'm to, I'm, I'm, I, I don't know if you can hear me. I'm to suggest that you turn your, your video off if you could, if you don't mind. Uh, you've got a weak signal and you're breaking up and that might help. Keep, keep your audio, but if you could just, just uh, uh, your camera. Hate ask, asking a photographer to do that. Let's see if that works a little better. I'm sorry. So if you could go again, please. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Can you see me? Yes. I'm still worried about freezing, but go ahead. If you, I'm sorry. So we talked to you talked briefly about your your assignment. You you've been on the streets a lot in Italy. Can you tell us what it's yeah, like being out there? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Go, I'm sorry. If you could talk to sorry. us a little bit. Of, I'm, I'm sorry. There's a time delay here. If you could tell us a little bit about being on the street, what you're seeing, and about your assignment, and and why you choose to be out there. Uh, why main, main, the main reason I was and I was working on a, on an artistic res, artist res, residency residency and all of a sudden the coronavirus came in my picture uh, even if I didn't want because I was support, completely different projects and every day was invading my picture invading my life and, uh, and my and my at certain moment was start to become. I have so many restrictions that uh, had to the artist residency stopped, and I decided to keep going on photographing uh, the, emer the emergency, the the, the, the the situation in Italy. So I decided to do three step back and uh, see this emergency from another perspective, which is still covering the news in a way, but I'm, I'm more onirically would uh, associate associate that with the plague. So I went through all the books about the plague in Italy on the 1600, and I start my my parkour from Sicily up to the north. Uh, yes, covering the news, but yet also having these uh, keywords in my mind, always telling me uh, what kind of subject I'm supposed to cover or not. So now I'm in the north. I'm keep going with or without assignment. Um, I was in assignment for Vanity Fair for two weeks. Uh, thanks for Kira Pollack. And uh, now I'm uh, more or less alone, uh, but I don't stop for, for money. I mean, I don't have money, but uh, I have to keep going because I want to finish this. Pro I want to keep going until the end. At this point, it's too silly to leave 
now uh, the, 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 this work. Yesterday I was in Venice, I was saying, I don't know if you catch that. The, the day before I was in Slovenia because Slovenia closed the borders and it's quite uh, a, long, uh, um, a long border. So every little street, every little alley have been closed uh, um, with any sort of a barrier, including stones. Um, and um, and uh, I was going for an entire day to try to get to Slovenia in any way possible. And every time I have these strange barriers, I photographed those all, all the day before yesterday. You know, every day, yes, there was Venice. I want to photograph this sculpture inside this church, which has been built after, uh, um, after the plague of Venice, which is the same one who came in Italy from China through Palermo and go to Venice. And the patriarch at the time um, wanted this church when the plague ended in Venice. And there is this amazing sculpture of, uh, which is, represents the plague the Virgin Mary. Okay, there is all the iconography from the, this is Venice, the, the, the trying to photograph that yesterday in a completely empty Venice. Uh, unbelievable. The reason I want to be a photographer many years ago, almost 30 now, uh, was this, this opportunity in really strange time. It was really strange walking and alone with no in the street in Venice. It's like it feels like in a, in a dummy, not a so, and that's so, it. I mean, that's what I'm doing. Alex, can you can you tell me uh, how do you feel being outside uh, with with this this virus around, and and what are you doing to stay safe? Tell us specifically what you do to make sure that you're going to be safe. Uh, safety. Uh, well, after a month, uh, uh, you start to recognize what really can be a danger. And not, let's say when you go to sign the hospital nowadays, it's uh, super safe in a, in a way because uh, when the doctor knows now and you are full on, basically the, the, the risk to get the virus is so reduced that, uh, I mean, we sanitize ourselves every 10 minutes for no reason. Even when we, I pay, I pay the highway toll and I sanitize my hands. It really it's become so over, over my, my hands almost corroded and that matter. Sometimes you, you lose uh, control and uh, you lose attention in a really weird situation. Like uh, I will say, you get after an entire day in the hospital, get and then you feel like, okay, I'm safe. But actually, you go buy bread and meat, and then you have really have to again get the the virus if you get the virus. Uh, for instance, the other day I was photographing the airport. A police came next to me because it was with the camera in the airport, and then because I didn't thought, I mean, I was more in alert. Uh, kick me away or ask me the question. So, but he, the guy was really close to me, uh, talking straight in my face. The, the, after that, I said to my sister, I got it now with this guy that is uh, in the airport every day and he doesn't wear any protection. That, for example, is the danger I think we, we're going, uh, we, we are facing. It's more like it's, you have to be an alert from the moment you go out in the house. Night, you have to always be an alert. I've been scrolling so through, uh, sharing my screen, and uh, scrolling through some of your photos from Vanity Thank Fair. Thank you. Yes, I see. They're very compelling. Uh, yeah, they're, those they're... are C square, C square print, print, sure, but normally are rectangular, four third. But anyway. So I guess you know. 
the the question always is why would you risk yourself for this but then when you look at this body of work perhaps you can understand why this is so compelling this is this is uh what you're doing what nusha has done out there what all of you who have been out in the field are doing is this documentation of a time in life that that uh, hopefully we won't see again but these are really compelling photos um Describe safety gear. Do you have gear? Did you buy it yourself? Did a did a magazine? Did Vanity Fair offer yeah. safety yeah. gear? Tell me how you're how you're staying safe and how you're protecting your equipment too. And now the gear I buy, I bought, and we talk about many gears. We talk about not because it's in a, a really infected area. You have to you can sanitize maybe the glasses if you. But basically, you have to throw everything away. I don't know, I call it in English uh, costumes. <laughs> I don't know, yeah. the white. Uh, your shirts, uh, your shirts. Or your, the, your... Whatever. All the rest you have to throw away. I mean, and uh, even sanitize so much that uh, with the hot hole, um, and basically destroy everything. My shoes, uh, have to, at the end, uh, is already. I, stupid say that but you know um so the gear you i bought the gear at the time uh, where those it's where they sell um for agriculture uh, like a poison for poison like a fertilizing or poison as well for uh, vegetables for for they have that kind of gears and i bought a lot of that you know glasses uh, uh everything you know they use even the, the thing to cut the kind of um uh, plastic uh visor uh, gloves tons of gloves and um uh, my camera i what i do and that i'm so far i tell i use for my hands uh but it contains alcohol again it doesn't really Camera, but uh, but it's really camera next to your face. You realize immediately. If I say, "Oh my God, that's, uh, let me let me let me take uh, let me sanitize again because it really goes to the eye, close to the eye." Um, that's what I do. I, I see my camera start to change color. I have to say, after all this alcohol, it's not nice. Uh, but uh, that's that's life, you know. You know, I will call and, Sony and say, have an extra camera for me. <laughs> and you, but you raise a point, <laughs> excuse me, that Nusha did as well. The idea of, of you can protect yourself in so many ways, but with your eyes open to look through the camera and the camera exposed, that that's perhaps the most vulnerable spot that you have as you're outside, I would imagine. Yeah, 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 of course, yes. It is, uh, you know, luckily, did you, I mean, when I shoot a picture, also I look what I'm doing from distance. You don't have to always be close by. But uh, yeah, it, it, is a, it is a danger there. Yeah, for sure. Now, Alex, do you have a few more minutes for you? I want to, want to speak with uh, Henry and uh, Brian as well. Do you have a few more minutes with us? Yeah, like really, literally three, four minutes, no problem. Yeah. Okay, so then let me ask you one more question before uh, you might have to leave. And that is, uh, what, what one or two or three, are there any lessons that you've gained from being out in the field? Things you would do differently, things you would do better, things to make sure. I mean, one of the big issues here, of course, it's my belief that photojournalists are the ones who are on the line more than anyone else, that you have to be out there. You can't use a a 10-foot boom pole for your audio that audio people are. You can't use Zoom for interviews that TV are, uh, TV journalists are. Uh, photojournalists are the ones that are out to the most. But hopefully there are lessons from this that we can learn that will keep us as safe as possible. Are there any things in looking back at this last month that you've spent that, that you would share to say, this is what I would do differently or this is what I know works best? Uh, I don't know. I don't know if it would, I would do something differently, but I, it's not a learning lesson I saw, and that's what I teach to my assistant all the time. You know, in a situation like this, which is, okay, when you go to 
country like Africa, you know, is you are the white guy, is kind of, I don't want to say easy because there is a lot of logistics to take care of. But when you are in your own country, uh, your so-called um, uh, like a VIP uh, red carpet disappear. You don't have it anymore. You are really equal. Same thing when I would work in the States, you know. Um, so when I see a lot of arrogance with, um, with other photographers, I don't get any access. And the, the access is everywhere, actually, you know. But with gentleness, um, I managed to get into to all the half of the people. I not, I not sent or uh, file any picture that was my damage someone who feel someone for example photograph someone dying i didn't want to find the picture so the parents would not see <coughs> sorry <coughs> not see the <coughs> see the, the dead body a little a little sorry <coughs> get a little water perhaps <coughs> So this is the few things I I noticed that really really make me think. Uh, um, gent gent gentleness helps a lot. Take picture, and also helps me to understand. Uh, well, that is something I I learned maybe long many years ago. But uh, in this situation, in my country, <clears throat> became more more pr more proud. <clears throat> Otherwise, uh, I don't have any tip or anything different than that. The rest is all uh, the same, you know. You know, our, our uh, at least mine, I, I won't speak for everybody else, but, but mine, when I hear somebody uh, <clears throat> hacking and coughing, of course, my, my first thought is, oh, my God, get text tested. Uh, I hope you're okay. Uh, thank you for joining us. If you have to run, please yeah. do. Uh, I'm going to going to switch Thank over you. some of the other journalists right now, and if if you're with us when when we go through, I'll come back some more. But thank you so much for your time, and stay safe. Okay. Thanks, Alex. Thank you very much. Henry, uh, Henry, I'll come to you in just a moment, but I want to get to Brian first. Brian, so um, uh, two things. I'd love to. You you've been out and uh, 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 doing coverage on the streets, so I want to hear your experience there. But I'd also love you to talk briefly about what sort of thoughts you have listening to uh, Alex and Nusha and, and, and their experiences. Anything that, that jumped out at you there? Uh, uh, yes, uh, what, what, I, what first jumped out to me is the fact that when we're out looking for stories and we weren't finding something unique, um, everyone is seeing it in their best interest just to back off and, and really not try to endanger themselves or enter into a situation where um, they're not telling something unique um, just by being somewhere. In other words, just people in masks, you know, that was, that was original, you know, weeks or months ago. It's not now to put ourselves in that situation to make images like that isn't quite as important. Um, you know, I, I'm based here in Kentucky. And for those who may not know, Kentucky is in the middle of America. And, and many of the stories that we tell here, our middle America stories, everything from economics to politics to healthcare, everything's here in, in Kentucky. So, um, but uh, with the specific, this coronavirus, um, Kentucky has been about two weeks behind much of America in, the, in, the, in, in that story. So it's been a challenge uh, to find that unique um, imagery to make uh, and where places in America are able to, or photographers in places in America are able to, you know, make these amazingly compelling images of the struggle uh, of this sickness of this, of this disease. Um, you know, here in Kentucky, that hasn't been a possibility. Um, statewide, we have, you know, two thirds of what many of the surrounding states have as far as cases, but that doesn't make the story that doesn't make the, the, the diseases impact on, um, residents on the citizens any less uh, because the uh, the hazard can't be mitigated that the the threat to every individual is real all the time so in covering my story in the stories I've been covering uh, mostly for Reuters um, through this through through here is is 
how how life is happening while this while this this disease makes its way uh, through us. Um, and because the diversity of Kentucky uh, and of uh, Southern Ohio and Indiana, where I, where I cover, um, you know, depending on the political uh, stance of the, the county in which you're working, you're going to have a very different story to tell. Um, and it is, um, it has been a challenge to uh, keep myself safe uh, because of the, uh, the people that for a long time just were not taking this as seriously as other places and corners in the world have been because they haven't seen its direct effects uh, like many other places in the world have. And that's uh, sadly to say um, we're hoping I should say it won't make it uh, just a later story here. Um, I have some unique uh, problems in my coverage. Uh, my wife is pregnant, so when I go out and work, um, I'm coming home. My my wife, I think we're we're due to have our second uh, boy here in, in just a, a couple of days, less than two weeks, I think. So um, you know, later reporting in the last month has been a challenge because every time I leave the house, every time I go to shoot an assignment, I have to weigh um, to make sure I'm making compelling images enough that warrant uh, the, the risk uh, that I'm placing myself and my family in. Um, and I think it is because um, where many pictures coming out of many of the big cities are um, incredibly compelling, uh, what we offer here from Kentucky is, is a look at how most middle of America is, is, is trying to live and trying to battle on through this. Um, and my background, um, you know, in hazard mitigation uh, for uh, 20 years in the military, um, you know, has me critically aware of every time I step out and every time I do anything, I need to um, make sure I'm protecting myself. And that includes uh, gloves and that includes masks. Uh, that includes um, lots of alcohol, uh, decontaminating myself and my equipment. Um, you know, skills that I learned how to do in the military um, because of very different threats um, are now coming back to play now. Uh, back to play here. Uh, but I've been grateful for, the, for that training because what it's been able to uh, enable me to do is to share, um, to share with my fellow journalists and, and you know, our, our professional community um, that self-care uh, is as important as any image that we're making. Uh, like you said, we can't, we, we, we can't hide 10 feet away with a boom pole or do it across Zoom. Um, and, and whether you're covering uh, a disease like this uh, or uh, covering hurricanes or breaking news or tragedy as it happens around the world all the time that photojournalists find themselves doing. We have to understand that um, just existing in these environments isn't our calling. That's not what our calling is. Our calling is to report for others to see uh, what's going on. So we have um, really two roles, A, uh, to report on what we see, but also um, to, ke to keep ourselves working, to keep ourselves safe. Uh, and to keep ourselves um, able to continue our reporting. Um, it can't be a second thought. They, the two have to be rolling together because um, uh, there, is, there, there, there is no way to separate what we're doing from where we have to do it. And, and uh, that's been incredibly challenging. Um, many of the things I've been covering in recent uh, days in, in the last two weeks have been, you know, the, the, the many Americans who are now feeling that it is time that we no longer quarantine ourselves, that we no longer have to separate ourselves. So there's large crowds are starting to form again. Uh, just the other day at the State House uh, in Kentucky, uh, crowds are now almost every other day gathering to protest uh, the government, uh, the government uh, rules on, on businesses being closed. And that brings together two, 300 people uh, in a very small space. And that is incredibly challenging to cover that uh, while maintaining um, your self-awareness um and it it, it uh, the two have to go hand in hand though because without one um uh, if you allow yourself to get sick um none of the work the work stops the work stops and and um we have to always uh have that at the front of our mind being a journalist, when you mentioned lots of alcohol, my, my thought immediately went to scotch, of yes. course. I, I, uh, we're here in Kentucky, so it's bourbon, but yeah. <laughs> but I presume, so, so just so that we're clear, it, it, it's, it's alcohol-based hand sanitizer, yeah. al alcohol-based sanitizer, yeah. Uh, yeah. above 70% alcohol. 70%, right? yeah. Yeah, uh, and, and that's, that's easy enough to put together at the house. You know, I mean, you know, it wasn't long that you couldn't get hand, hand sanitizer um, anywhere. 
so you just end up uh, getting the proper uh, rubbing alcohol, uh, you know, alcohol available at the right percentage and, and making it up yourself. I have, I have spray bottles, um, uh, usually carry three of them with me. Um, every time I get out of the car, in, in other words, I put on my protective equipment on, uh, gloves, mask, um, a hat uh, and, and glasses before I leave the car so that I know those things are clean when I put them on my body uh, and I step out of the car. Before uh, I just I real quick, you said, you said glasses. That means yep. goggles of some kind, not uh, just well, prescription I, glasses. The safety glasses, safety glasses, okay. yep. uh, just to, you know, keep, keep spray or particulates out of your eyes. Um, uh, so you, you, you put your protective equipment on before you leave, step out of the car uh, and you take, um, you know, one of your hand sana one of your spray bottles in my case of sanitize you have any, and I set it on top of my car, kind of tuck it into the, uh, into a little cubby on top of the car so that when I go and do my job, I go photograph whatever I'm photographing. When I come back to the car, the first thing I do is uh, reach right on top of the car and spray everything down before I even open a car door. So I'm not, so I know uh, that the inside of my car was clean when I arrived. And my goal is to make sure that I'm not taking anything back into the car with me um, because the car is the bridge to everywhere else you're going, whether it be home or the grocery store or wherever else you're going. So you want to keep that space clean. Um, in the military, we called that our, we called that our hotline. You didn't want to cross with anything dirty, meaning contaminated. You didn't cross the hotline with anything dirty. You didn't, you didn't go back. So I spray off everything. I spray my hands. Uh, I spray, um, I spray the outside. I missed the outside of my mask uh, and glasses. Uh, and then I, um, take all those off. I'm making sure I, I'm not contaminating myself while I'm doing that. I take all those, take the gloves off and the gloves will go into a, an, into a trash bag for, for, uh, to be thrown away. Um, the glasses and the mask will sit in a, in a specific place in the car where they can't roll around or possibly contaminate other things. Um, and then on, uh, so then, uh, once I've, uh, doffed all of my safety equipment, uh, um, uh, I have a second spray bottle, uh, just inside the car door. So I'll, I'll I'll open the door, grab that again, sanitize my hands, um, before even sitting down in the car. Um, and, uh, before I touch anything, I'll sanitize my hands again. Um, you know, and then the last thing, the last thing I do is, is, is I should say before I take off the gloves is sanitize the dirty bottles of sanitizer. So they're good for the next time. Uh, so it's, it's a process, uh, you step forward in your process and then you just reverse that process and step backwards in it, uh, in order that, you know, the safety equipment doesn't prevent us, uh, from coming into contact with with the disease or whatever hazard we're, we're being presented with in this case the disease this it's only a momentary safety valve to make sure that we're becoming as least contaminated as possible and if we and if we aren't um, uh, entering and, and, and leaving our protective equipment in proper fashion it's 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 of little use because um, if, if we if we have to consider everything dirty once we head out into the environment. So if we're taking that dirty stuff home with us, uh, it, it, it kind of defeats its purpose. Um, so it's a very methodical uh, process that we need to get into our heads. Um, I've talked many of my uh, local journalists here in Louisville and Lexington, Kentucky through, through this process that we can uh, best protect ourselves. Um, we owe that not just to, to our, our mission, our job, but the last thing we, we want to do is to become a strain uh, on uh, infrastructure. Uh, we don't want to become uh, sick or we need to have attention brought to us uh, while we're out trying to tell the story of others. So all these things that we do um, and this constant situational awareness that we, um, that we're, that we are uh, obligated to have it's, it's, it's not just for our safety or to tell the stories, but it's also, um, you know, everybody else is staying home or a lot of people are staying home and we're not. So we take on an extra obligation to make sure that we're doing all that we can um, to do our job as safely as we can. I want to get to Henry next, but a quick question to you, equipment. We heard Alex talk about, you know, his plea to Sony for a new camera. Uh, <laughs> Sony, if you're listening, is, I'll take one too. Yeah, this stuff's very harsh. Yeah. Uh, the chemicals we're talking about, is there anything you can do to protect the camera to make certain that you're not doing damage while you're making certain that you're safe using that equipment? Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, you know, I use the same sanitizer on my equipment as I do on my hands and, and everything like that. Uh, one thing that I, uh, I do with, the, uh, with, with my equipment is I make sure to have just a damp rag. And after I put the alcohol on it and um, uh, put the alcohol, it's mist, it's, it's a very fine mist of alcohol that I, that I use. Um, 
you know, I'm, I, I wipe my camera down with the damp rag because, uh, like he says, uh, I mean, you know, the rubber handles and, and the rubber that um, surrounds uh, the camera, and in addition to the, the hard, uh, not the not the hard parts, but the, the soft parts, the plastic parts will, will, will corrode or will, will erode um, with, with this constant placing of alcohol. And so it's, it's very important to, uh, um, after you decontaminate equipment, um, that you wipe it down with, with a less, har you know, a non-harsh, well, I just use, I just used a, a damp rag to get, uh, to get whatever you've used to clean your equipment, to get the residue of that off the camera. And are you still with us? You've popped off my screen here. I assume you're still with us, joining us from Greece. Henry Kanaj, are you there? Um, I don't see you, so I can't unmute you. Let me, uh, pardon me for just a second while I scroll through and see if I can find him and unmute him if I need to. So just a moment, but I don't see him there. Hopefully he'll be popping back in. Henry, are you there? just disappeared. All right, I will keep an eye out for him. I'm going to look real quick. We had a couple of questions. So let me uh, uh, remind you of onlinequestions.org. The password to get in is 2020-0420. That's 2020-0420. Um, so uh, uh, two quick questions from, from this to all the, all the photographers. Anyone who wants to take this. During these days, the entire world is covering the pandemic. How can a photographer do that while maintaining his authority? Not quite sure. Maybe one of you can uh, can tell me a little bit more about what th what that might mean. Anybody want to take that? Thomas, you're still up there. We seem to have people dropping off. Uh, Brian, I know that the. Yeah, I'm not sure what quite he means by authority, but uh, um, you know there are a lot of other stories. There are many, many stories and stories within stories to be told. As this, as as the as the story of this virus uh, continues, it's not just about sick people. Uh, you know, and um, it's it, it it is about the effects that this disease or any could have on our society. And as compelling as some of the pictures are, and and uh, you know, I'll point you I'll point you to uh, Lucas Jackson in in, uh, in New York City. Is you know these amazingly compelling images. Um, you know, there's a lot of stories that we can find that that don't require uh, that don't require the, uh, the the level of access that um, that uh, others are uh, that others have. So um, it it can be a story of economics. It can be a story of need. It can be a story of joblessness. Now it can be a story of um, you know, the many um, side uh, angles to this, to, to this, to this one bigger story. Um, and I think that if we uh, look for those stories and continue to um, not just look for sick people in masks to take photographs of, um, but to uh, tell the story of, of our society, perhaps moving through this, um, it is a way for a photographer to uh, really have an impact on the greater story uh, visually um, without, without the need for, you know, an assignment desk sending them into, you know, the, the hardest hit hospitals in the world. So uh, as I look for other, for the, for the folks to log back in, um, let me, you've, you've addressed this a little bit, Brian, but, yeah. but if you could talk a little bit more about this, um, as you, as you mentioned, you have, you have a young child at home, you have a wife at home and a wife who's pregnant. Yeah. What motivated you, given the risks that entails, um, obviously confidence from your background and being able to hopefully mm -hmm. keep yourself safe, but what motivated you, what drove you to get out there and do this uh, with that? With that? And I see uh, Henry is back up, so we'll come back to him in a second, but quickly, just if you could talk briefly to your motivation. Well, I, I think that to the story of, in my case, the story of middle America is many times not told. Um, and I think as many of us do, we have, we feel an obligation to tell the stories of where our camera finds us. Um, and so um, <laughs> my wife would probably ask the same question, what would motivate me to uh, leave the comfort of home to, to go out and tell these stories. But, um, you know, the, we don't tell the stories, you know, for Instagram likes or for, you know, or for many of us uh, don't tell the stories just to say, look what we've done. It's, it's really a, 
a way to cause change and cause action to happen on behalf of these people that are affected in one way or another by the story. Um, and, and to for, to have people, you know, form opinions, uh, to make their mind up about what's, what's right, what's wrong, what's real and what's not. And, and the only way for us to do that is to get and tell the stories. Um, so I would, uh, take all the precautions I could, uh, mitigate every hazard possible, you know, just the same. I mean, quite honestly, and I don't like the equations of, uh, you know, this virus to war. Uh, I think the two are incredibly, um, different. Um, but you know, I think that, um, just as I had to take as many, uh, hazards off the board as possible and then do my job, then you have to take as many boards, off, uh, hazards off the board now, and then for us to do our job. So, that's what compels me to get out and tell the story is, is to hopefully help others. I heard an interesting quote that uh, uh, I'm, I'm not going to tell it quite directly, but it was that the difference between this and covering war is that with this, you bring the enemy home. So uh, uh, that, that I think that is one of the reasons that makes this stand out more so in many ways. Mm -hmm. Henry, thank you for your patience and I appreciate your getting back in. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your experience, uh, where you are and what you're photographing? Hello, hello everybody. Uh, I'm in Athens. Uh, I live in, in the city since 30 years. Uh, I, have, uh, I have photographed uh, in different uh, in different assignment, uh, outdoor and indoor. Uh, I have I have been in a, in a hospital <clears throat> uh, one time, and uh, this this it was the most uh, difficult times that I had, and of course I have photographed in the street many times. Uh, the streets are most empty, and I am trying to to photograph what is visible. Uh, and most of the time in uh, in Athens, uh, you can see uh, people waiting in the line in a supermarket or a post office, or uh, people uh, walking with dogs. Uh, Yeah. So why, how do, I, I should have been asking you all this. I'm really curious, how are people responding to you? Those who are the subjects of your photographs, people that, that, that are out in the streets. Is there any response that you get from people like that? Same, sometimes, or I can say most of the time, the people are, uh, uh, are happy. Are happy because as you walk around, then you see the 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 streets is empty, and sometimes the people that understand that there's somebody that it's taking pictures, uh, sometimes they feel comfortable and happy. I can say uh, because most of the time uh, I can see uh, empty street and nobody is outside. And what are, what are you doing inside? Are, are there ways that, have you found ways as Thomas has and as Nusha has to uh, photograph this in a way that, that keeps you safe but still engages you as a, as a photographer? Uh, inside, I'm trying, as a photographer, uh, I'm, 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 I'm traveling a lot. And this is my first time that I can say that it's, I stay in my, my home since one month and a half. Uh, so for me, and I have a, and I have a family. So, and my, and, and my daughter now it's uh, one and a half. And most of the time I have lived, as I remember in, in a... Hope we just lost you there. Hopefully you're coming back. If it's a problem, if you might you might be able to sh just shut off your video and keep talking because that will the video eats up a lot of bandwidth. Henry, you still there? Yeah. 
There you go. Okay. So if you keep your video off, maybe that will give us the bandwidth to hear. So I'm sorry if you, okay. you were talking about your daughter at one and a half. So, yeah. So most of the time uh, I'm, I'm out and uh, I don't have time to, uh, to enjoy as I want uh, to stay with my family and, and of course my daughter now. So this time is for me. And of course I don't have to take too many pictures that I, I want to take uh in, in inside uh, inside my home so this time is also interesting to to see to see my daughter and to understand more uh but of course uh to have time also for myself to to read books and uh, uh and of course to have time to, to relax. I have, I have two questions for all of those who are watching. Uh, only a few of you have your video on, but, but I wanna ask for a show of hands on both of these. Uh, first of all, how many of you are using photography to journal your life, your neighbor's life, whatever that might be, to in a sense document what's happening around you, even if you're doing it from inside? How many are doing that? That's, that's almost everybody. Uh, I should have asked this one earlier. This is a tougher question. How many have, uh, have been touched, have, have had a family member, a friend, someone who's been affected by this? Okay. Um, all right, we're gonna go in a few minutes to um, uh, uh, Judith uh, Matloff, who's with us to talk about trauma and safety. One of the things that, that, that's not come out yet in this conversation, but I think it's an important part of this, is, is the trauma that we can face uh, on a daily job. We already know about all those issues out there with uh, the anger in people, especially if you color poli cover politics. There's so many reasons that, that, that we might face trauma. And uh, uh, I want to talk about that a bit and, and how we can address that and how we can make sure that we stay healthy because something like this can be uh, incredibly devastating. And, and after we talk to Judith, we're also going to go to a couple of folks from uh, Magnum to talk about uh, uh, their work and what they've been doing during this process, during this crisis. Uh, but, but if I could, Nusha, I wanted to ask you real quick. Um, um, we talked about your motivation. We talked about those sorts of things, but when, when you're on the streets, uh, and I'm, I'm glad you came back in. Uh, I, when you're on the streets, how do you address uh, the issues? Or, or, how, how are people responding to you? I, when, when you're taking photos and people are there, how do they respond to you? Are you getting any, anything negative from them? I'm just, I'm just curious what the response is as you're out there. Yeah, it's a very interesting question. Um, <clears throat> While I was on assignment for National Geographic, it was uh, some days um, uh, before our new year. So people were out shopping and um, the, the bazaar was quite busy. So I went out and I started taking out my camera and I had so much reaction from people who I wanted to photograph because I have no idea, but they were thinking by themselves as if they were doing something which is not right. Because in, in, in a time of pandemic, you, the, the, the most, um, um, one of the things that we all have to do is to stay home. And, um, and these people, they were all out as if there's nothing. So as if the, the life is normal. And I think they were shy to be photographed. They didn't want to have their images taken because they knew they are doing something which is wrong. And um, I got into some argument with people um, at, the, um, at the metro station in, in north of Tehran where I was standing, the light was beautiful. People, they would come out of the metro station with their mask on, with gloves, and I mean, most of the people, they had their mask on, but they didn't want to be 
photograph. And uh, one man, um, he stopped me and he like pushed my uh, shoulder. He said, why you, why you took my image? I said, uh, why, you, why you think I'm here to take picture of because of what is happening everywhere in the world and I have to tell our story from Iran. He said, you have to first ask me uh, a permission if you can take my pictures. And I said, first of all, you have your mask on. I, no one can really recognize who you are. Second, um, if as a photographer, I can ask everybody on the street, can I take your picture, then it's not a documentary, you know, because um, if you have to stop people one by one and ask their permission, then what kind of a photographer you are? Normally, um, from the faces of people, I can sense if they want to be photographed or not. But with a mask on, it was so difficult to read their faces and their reaction. I think that was where I was confused um, also uh, as a photographer who wants to be photographed and who doesn't want. And um, that was the problem because I could not see their faces and I get their expression. Normally, this is how I take pictures. Um, from like one meter, I know if they want to be photographed or not. And um, that is how I, I, I work for 22 years. I don't ask people for their permission on street because then I lose the moment. Uh, I, and just a, a quick follow-up to that. I'm curious, uh, had that person, do you think that person would have confronted you had you been a man taking his photo? The thing is, like, it's, 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 it's quite funny, but I have to say, um, as a women photographer covering Iran uh, all these years, I never had problem because I'm a woman photographer. Actually, being a women photographer here, people, they trust you more because you're women. They trust women much more than male photographer. So I'm quite lucky in that front here. All right, so we have a few questions. I'm going to try to answer, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to try to get to those toward the end because uh, we've been going so long on this. I'm sorry that Tomas hasn't been able to get back in to join us, but what I'd like to do now is pivot a bit to the whole idea of, of trauma. And I want to uh, introduce Judith Matloff again from the DART Center. Uh, Judith, are you still with us here? And if yeah, you could, if you great. could unmute, un unmute and let's, uh, 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 talk a little bit about, can, can we be very basic here and talk about what trauma is, first of all? Well, what it is, is you're having a normal reaction to abnormal events. You've had an overload of um, exposure to extremely upsetting circumstances. Uh, oftentimes, if, if we're talking about classic PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, we're talking about that your body goes into overdrive oftentimes with adrenaline and then it comes down in a in a very radical way and very upsetting images stay lodged in the amygdala, which is the part of the memory that processes the part of the brain that processes memory. I think what most people are experiencing right now is not PTSD. I think we're just all of us, whether it be regular citizens or photojournalists, we're all just experiencing unusual stress. And that can come from the threat to our lives, seeing people around us sick, just the constant fear of growing sick and the self-isolation and the disruption to ordinary life as well as anxiety about earning money. And um, so I would rather describe it less as trauma and more as stress, just a, a normal response. I, I, I think it's better not to pathologize this and stigmatize it with a word like Trauma. I think what it is, is we're all suffering from incredible stress, exhaustion, and in many instances, anxiety. Well, it, 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 not, to, not to, to challenge that to any extent, but, but isn't part of the thing that we should do is also destigmatize trauma? And I'm saying that yep. from the position of someone who's, who's in therapy right now, and I'm very open about this, about right. dealing with with PTSD symptoms, like P PTSD like symptoms over things that I've done over the last 15, 20 years. Um, and and I, there's a culture within journalism in general that is, is 
we would say cowboy in the West, uh, that is macho, that is, um, you know, we're tough, we're just going to get through it. And frankly, I, for years, I told myself that my therapy, <clears throat> excuse me, my therapy was covering these stories and that I didn't need to worry about the stress or the trauma or whatever you want to call it, that, that by covering it, that was going to keep me safe. I was wrong. Uh, so isn't part of it, and we can call it stress and that's fine, but, but, but destigmatizing if, my understanding is that it's stress, but if it becomes long-term, that adrenaline keeps hitting, keeps hitting, it, it can affect brain chemistry. And that's when PTSD oh, it can, begins it to It can become, indeed. Can. We're only a few months into this. So I would say probably very few of us are actually suffering from post-traumatic stress at the right. moment. Uh, so that's why I'm trying to get away from labels and, and instead look at how we are reacting without labeling it. Um, I think once one starts applying medical terms to a label, it, it can sometimes complicate things. Without a doubt, we're all under incredible, incredible emotional stress at the moment. And that's what I'd like to address. There are quite a few um, things people can do to address it and to try to cope with it better. And I think, you know, that's what I'd like us to look towards are the sort of things that can help us build resilience rather than putting a label on something that some people may resist or may feel uncomfortable about that they themselves may self stigmatize. But I think, you know, I, I think the important thing is to look at how we can build up our own self defenses and our own social networks so that we can cope better with this extraordinary situation that we're all undergoing. And that's fair enough. So, so what advice do you have for journalists and photographers in particular who are covering the pandemic or any potentially stressful situation? What, what are the basic things they should be doing, watching out for, and just simply to be aware of? Well, probably the biggest indicator and contributor to building resilience is social networks and social contact. So anything you can do to check up on colleagues, just kind of check in, maybe develop a very, a very intimate buddy system. Um, I have two people that I check in with about seven times a day and we keep each other going. We send each other jokes, we're constantly checking and one of them right now has a very, very bad case of COVID-19 and we're, you know, we're on top of her. Have you drunk your fluids? We send her funny messages. Uh, we make sure we have contact with her on a daily basis or several times a day. Um, if you were in an editor position, I think it's really, really important to tell your photographers that remind them that you are aware of the fact that their work is very, very important. People are out there. I mean, I'm hearing these incredible stories of all of you doing this work in the field. You are doing, making an immense contribution to society. And it's important to remind each other and remind the people who you're working with and supervising that they are creating um, an incredible body of work documenting this extraordinary time in, in history and that they are contributing to society in a very big way. So that's one thing, you know, build your own networks, find your people and make sure you're checking in with them constantly. If you see a colleague going through and you, you sense they're going through a very, very tough time, um, do what you can to boost that person. So that would be the first thing, social contact. You know, and even something like these Zoom calls, I don't know about you, but I find them, you know, we're, we're isolated, we're at home, we're, we're working in very, 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 very demanding, challenging situations. And it's, these Zoom calls are amazing in terms of building up that sense of community. So keep that community going, particularly with visual te technology where you can see faces. That would be one thing. The other thing, which is absolutely critical, is have a routine. Try to normalize your abnormal life as much as possible. Try to get up at the same time every day, hop into the shower, make yourself as clean and presentable as you can, even if you're not leaving the house. Eat meals regularly and nutritious meals. Watch the alcohol and um, weed intake. You know, Really make sure you're not abusing stuff because the temptation is there right now. It's actually gonna weaken your defenses in terms of being able to deal with this. Get a lot of rest go to bed at the same time every day. You know, I'm telling you all this and I know I'm a journalist. Like, it's very hard to have a regular life, but do it as best you can. Try to do things in a regular way and try to get as much sleep as you can because sleep is one of the things that will make you resilient and will make you strong emotionally. And Another, sorry. No, yeah. go ahead. 
no, no, go ahead. You had a question. Okay. No, I, I wanted to, to talk a bit about, you know, one of the uh, secondary, secondary stress, secondary trauma, uh, the idea that you don't have to be the one out there actually in people's faces, taking photographs, worrying about your physical safety, that photo editors, that other people dealing with these things, seeing these photos can also uh, experience some level of stress, right? Of course. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, just looking at images over and over and over again, one thing that was very interesting about, I don't know if people recall the massacre of the school children in Beslan in, in Russia. Uh, some of the, the video editors who had to go through the images of it time and again suffered a degree of post-traumatic stress equivalent to those who were also taking images and were on the spot. I think, you know, there's something about an image that gets lodged in the brain. It doesn't have a beginning, a middle, and an end. It doesn't have a narrative which can end. The image is just a very, very static thing that gets lodged. And I think that can have a very, very um, detrimental effect on how you're processing information. So somebody had mentioned earlier, maybe it was you, Dale, about journaling. And I think, you know, when you think about how many war, war photographers or war correspondents have written memoirs. And I think journaling is a very, very good way to put something to rest. Just write that image down, write that experience down, just put it away on a piece of paper. And I think it, it helps you process what you've been going through throughout the day. We, and we don't live in isolation. So, so yeah. these are stressful times. And there are other things going on in our lives. There, there are, you know, bad relationships. There's, there's all sorts of things. So, so there's a layering of these sorts of things. And, and that, that also has an effect, doesn't it? It does. It does. And I think that's all the more reason why it's absolutely critical to build up that buddy system right now. Because your job is very upsetting. You may have other stresses at home. But if you have people who you can go to, who you can seek that support and that camaraderie and that solidarity, I think it will help you deal with these stresses. And I'm, raised, I'm, I'm, I'm raising that because, because one of the stressors for, for many photographers right now is the loss of income. And that's yeah. also going to, to add to, that layers of, to those layers of stress. Yeah, no, without a doubt, it's, it's, it's devastating. As hard as it may be, because you can't control the future, work on things that you can control. If you have tasks and goals that can be achieved, that give you a sense of mastery, focus on those. Try not to um, project too much in, into the future. We don't know what our earnings are gonna be like in six months. We don't know what this health situation is gonna be like in six months. We don't know about the safety of our families in six months. So try to think of your life as just a 24 hour period. Literally try to live as much as you can. And I realize it's difficult day by day, take each day at a time. And it's a way of managing the anxiety about the, what, the, what the future may bring. So what should we be looking for? What are the indicators? What are, what are the warning signs that we might be suffering from stress? There are quite a few. <laughs> um, and they can take, they can manifest their, themselves in opposite ways. You may feel very numb or you may feel very jittery and overly, overly active and overly anxious. You could be having panic attacks. You could be, on the other hand, you could be withdrawing into depression. You could have loss of appetite or you could be compulsively eating. Uh, one very common sign of certainly post-traumatic stress is, is um, our nightmares and flashbacks where your mind is constantly returning back to a very, very upsetting image or event that happened. Um, you might be very quick to anger. Um, you might be highly irritable. On the other hand, you may be withdrawing. You just may not want to interact with people at all. So there's a wide array of emotional responses. But I think one key is that if you're not yourself, if you are acting in a way that's extreme and is not the way you behave and feel and respond normally, then that definitely is a warning sign. So when you, if you recognize, if you see some of these in yourself, 
how do, how do you respond? What's, what's the best thing to do? Take a deep breath. <laughs> Talk to someone. Uh, I think, again, that's where your buddy system comes in. Talk with your, your people and say, you know, I, I'm not myself. I, I am really not handling things very well. And I think just the act of talking really helps. And Dale, you mentioned something which is really, really critical, which is if you feel it's getting to the point where you're really not handling it on your own with your social support network, there is absolutely no shame in seeking um, professional counseling. And I, I, think, I, I think it's, you know, this is not normal what we're going through. And we are undergoing a level of challenges, emotional challenges, that really are akin to a war zone in many ways. I think people have alluded to it. And there is absolutely no shame in consulting with a mental health professional or a social worker to try to um, regain your equilibrium. One of the elements though, I think that uh... This certainly happens for those who cover war, for those who cover things that are, that are somewhat unusual is, and I don't know if I can describe this well, but, but I experienced this. I spent a year in South Sudan in war zones there and coming back, you have this experience, you have this part, uh, there's something that you've done that becomes part of your life. And frankly, most people don't wanna talk about it. So part of the isolation can come from a lack of understanding, a lack of knowledge, not, not purposeful, but at times ignorance or just simply unaware. So it's hard to find people to talk to. So, <coughs> excuse me, I guess I'm saying that in part as journalists and as photographers, uh, the, the, the social group is important, but a peer group. So that people right. that you can talk to who, who get it that right. you don't have to explain so much. The therapist I've arrived at is someone who has dealt with uh, a soldiers returning from, from combat, but also who's dealt with journalists who have been in war zones. So I have a comfort level with him that I wouldn't have with, with, with other therapists. And I'm not saying that it, it, it needs to go to therapy, but if you're having that group that you talk to and it can be done by Zoom, let it be a group of people who understand at least your profession and what you do day to day so that you don't have to constantly explain all that before they begin to feel some level of empathy for what you're, what you're going through. Yeah, I think that raises a really good point. I think one of the few silver linings of this extraordinary situation that we're all facing right now is that journalists are not isolated. Your average citizen is going through exactly what we are. And they may not be going into the streets and shooting images, but we're all traumatized, every level of society. So I would, I would argue that we're actually less isolated than when we're covering a conflict and we don't want to talk about it with our parents or, you know, we want to shield our children from it. I, I think everybody is feeling absolutely distraught at the moment and in a state of mourning and anxiety. And I think it makes it in some ways easier to break that isolation that we oftentimes feel when we come back from war. It's interesting. And I, th I think that uh, obviously people are going to respond in different ways simply <clears throat> by nature of the physical environment in which they live. But we live in the North country uh, of New York. And uh, if I were to turn the camera, you could see the foothills of the Adirondacks out my window. We live in a neighborhood of about a hundred homes. And in some ways, isolation has made us more social. There are people walking the streets constantly. We go out for a walk every day if we can. We stay a great distance. Everybody's good about they walk on that side of the street. You walk on this side as you pass. But there's almost, I'm seeing neighbors I haven't seen in a long time. So that sort of addresses the, the social uh, part that you're talking about. And I've heard other people talk about this too. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see what happens as this lifts if those those connections remain. Yeah, and if they don't, I think it's okay because it means that we don't need them. You know, we're, I, I, I don't know about the rest of you, I'm getting phone calls from people I haven't spoken to in 40 years. I'm talking on the phone more than I've ever talked since I was a teenager. 
I hang out of my door. I live in New York City. You know, we have the seven o'clock cheer for the emergency workers. And um, I'm getting to know neighbors I never met because we stand there and we bang with our pots. I have a bang buddy. She's like an 80 year old woman who lives in some window across the street. I mean, I think there is an immense sense of solidarity that despite the self-isolation. And I think that's something we have to emphasize to each to all of ourselves, and it's one of the things that can sustain ourselves. There's another thing that I, uh, I didn't mention, which I think is absolutely critical, and it becomes challenging when you're self-isolating, but exercise is absolutely critical to maintaining your equilibrium in a very, very stressful situation. So anything you can do, if, if you can get outside like Dale can, and you can go hiking and be in nature. That's absolutely wonderful. If you can, I live in New York City, I can get out to a park, you know, heavily masked and everything. If you can do yoga at home, whatever it is, you know, whatever physical activity it is that can calm you down. But that is one of the best ways to beat stress and to deal with traditional trauma. So again, I would urge people to be as physically active as they possibly can, because it's gonna be one, great way to, to cope with the situation. One other quick question. What, what advice do you give to editors and the people who assign stories? How should they be working with their journalists to be aware of this? I think don't push people. If they indicate that they don't feel comfortable about something, trust them. Um, don't push people to go beyond their comfort zone and tell them every single time, every single day you speak to them, how important their work is. Rem Remind them that you're there watching their backs. Uh, remind them that you value them as people and them as professionals. I think people really need to be supported by, by their employers. And it's really, really important to express your appreciation for them. There's another element to that, that that's uh, fascinating and frustrating to me. There's been more of an awareness, at least amongst national organizations. You know, I, I still do some work at NPR and not to, not to pick on them, they, they all seem to do this. 10 years ago, they didn't have resources available. There was not, it's something that journalists didn't talk about, organizations didn't have anything. Today, there's tons of resources uh, and they're, they're uh, readily available to at least to employees. I know a lot of photographers are freelancers, but at least to employees, it's out there. But what they do, and I get these emails regularly, is they send these notes saying, don't forget, We've got these resources. We've got this great counselor you can call. We have these other resources you can avail yourselves of, which to me is akin to telling your friend who just lost their spouse or their parent, hey, call me if you need me. The reality is when you're in the middle of something like this, you may not have the wherewithal to call someone. You may not reach out. Uh, there needs to be a more proactive way for, for editors, for bosses, but I would say for all of us, if we see a friend who might be suffering, that we make certain that we reach out and not put the onus on them to call you. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, one, one more quick minute. Is there, we've done sort of like a brief overview. Is there anything I've missed that you want to make sure that we emphasize here? Again, social contact, which is just what you've been talking about. Social contact, just to run it through routines, get enough sleep, get exercise, eat well, and be kind to yourself. Be kind, really be empathic to yourself and sympathetic to yourself. If there are days when you're just not productive or you feel your work hasn't been good, cut yourself some slack. You're living through a very difficult time. Judith, thank you. Uh, I want to go to, uh, uh, oh, nope, Thomas, you're back in. Glad to see you back with us. Um, we, we were talking when, uh, when you disappeared there a bit about um, um, how people are, uh, uh, what their motivation are for, is for continuing to take photos. And, and I cut you off to, to get over to Alex. And I wanted to ask you about that, about your motivation to do what you're doing right now. And then we're going to get over to the, to the editors uh, for Magnum. But, but could you respond just, just your motivations, what your reasoning is for the kind of work that you're doing while you're uh, uh, in isolation there? What, what do you hope the people will get, for instance, from those photos of those people in isolation? Yeah, so, uh, sorry, I had to step out for a second. I was That's actually fine. trying to um, get access to a funeral, actually, and, uh, which is something I've had in my 
normal life before, which is just it wouldn't happen on two computers simultaneously. Um, I think probably from, well, I, I think why I made that choice in this specific situation now was that I, I, I really thought I can't, I can't add on anything on, in being out in the streets, sort of like I thought I'm, I'm kind of doing what everybody else is doing. And, and then I think in a very egotistical way for me, it's always curiosity. I mean, I was more curious about what is happening there. What is this strange world? What is this? And then maybe also the challenge to the challenge to get it right in to photograph something. Of course, it's kind of stupid to sit at home and take pictures of my screen or do Apple shift Apple three or whatever for 5,000 times a day. And, um, but, and, uh, but I still think it's something that's so. I don't know. I'm, I'm maybe the f parts of this. It's what what makes me. Maybe the failures are interesting. I think sort of the what doesn't work. I find it interesting. I think all in all, like it's it's going to be a doc hopefully it's going to be some sort of document of this time of this reaching out into a, into a a, a world we don't don't know. There is no other way to do it than to be on these calls or be in this in this strange space. So. Um, yeah, I don't think it's the, it's going to be, I think at the beginning it was more like, well, this is the future. This is something, this is almost this new world. Of course, we're going to go back to a normal world and I'm going to go back and go out and take pictures. I mean, that's normal pictures. So, and, uh, but then the, yes, the curiosity and I'm trying to be, I'm trying to stay clean in a way that I don't want to, I don't want it to be a, a, a gimmick. So I'm really only doing, I'm trying only to do things that really aren't possible in another way. So as soon as it's as soon as I realize somebody else could actually go and photograph this in another way, well, I'm not going to do it because I don't want to. And, okay. Uh, so uh, yeah. one one quick thing is that that I, I I will admit to feeling a bit stupid here. I, when you talked about photographing these Zoom things, I had this image in my head of your your monitor there and your camera on a tripod and everything set up. You're just sitting at five. Yeah. <laughs> this is what you're doing? To I just did it. <laughs> Control Apple three. <laughs> Okay. No, I do have a camera. I have a, I have a, I have a camera for the, to give some variety to it, but it's, it's pointless. I mean, it's not, it's not bad. And it's not, uh, it's not the point. <laughs> it's, it's much easier than I, than I was imagining. <laughs> okay. Thomas, thank you. So uh, we're, we're pushing on time here. I would like to get to our editors because I think that's a really interesting uh, conversation to be had too. Dale, uh, thank you. Dale, if it, yeah. could I add something uh, just to of what course. Judith was saying? Uh, just quickly, um, because I think uh, just a quick bridge between my current life and my previous. First of all, I think that when we talk about stress, there's an absolute difference between stress and trauma. Um, you know, stress is, we deal with stresses every single day. And, um, uh, you know, they come in, in our lives in different sizes and in different ways. And, um, and, and eventually, yes, or any individual event could lead to trauma. Um, that that being said, um, it is it is our obligation, and it would have preferably happened long before now, is to build that resiliency uh, in ourselves. And we have to understand that everybody, um, you know, it's 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 a it's it's not an on off switch. It's much like a dimmer switch. At least for me, it is personally. There is no on or off to stress and trauma in life. You know, we're in it's an everyday occurrence, and sometimes that light is really really bright, and other times, you know, we can turn down that dimmer. Um, and we don't always have control of that, which is the other thing that really we, we absolutely need to understand is, is we can't control the situation. Um, but for me, and, you know, I mean, I used to diffuse IEDs in Iraq, so this is nothing in relation to that. You know, that, that, that dimmer switch is way the opposite direction. However, what's, what's important to understand is um, our methods and our techniques that we use to get through the, our days um, is very much a... Um, uh, a, I won't say a crutch, but, but, but a way for us to um, move past and, and deal with the stresses as they arrive. So in other words, um, you know, I came from a life of mitigating hazard. So as I go through my day and I'm mitigating the hazards that I can and reducing those stresses as they come to me, uh, I can very much prevent having a box full of stress to deal with at the end of the day. Um, you, we can't control the environment. We can only control ourselves. Um, and right now our environment is not normal and we have to come and we have to grasp that. We have to understand that this is not normal. What we're, what many of us are doing. Um, but it's, it is uh, very possible for us to take it off in little bites 
and deal with it and mitigate these stresses in little bites uh, as opposed to dealing with them as a, uh, a, a whole situation that, that seems insurmountable, obviously, for good reason at times. And what you just said about the social network is absolutely critical. Um, you need to have both your um, family life where you're not dealing with all these crazy daily things. And you have to have, in my opinion, a professional time where you can go to peers and say, can you believe that crap that we just had to put ourselves through? And it's not always fair to take them home. Um, and it's not always healthy to take them home. So sometimes it's good to have a trusted colleague where you can just dump on. Um, and and that, is, that is critically important. Um, you know, these feelings like you're saying about, um, you know, normalizing, giving a stigma, obviously. But we have to be very careful to separate um, stress from trauma. Because if we don't, if, if we just lump them all into one crowd, um, we're going to do two things. We're going to stress the resources within our community who can really help us deal with, with, with the situations we're going through. And we're also going to possibly we run the risk of diminishing um, those who are dealing with true trauma and, and, and true things. You know, in the military, they put you through the questioning, do you have PTSD? Well, am I sad my friends died? Yes, I'm sad my friends died. Do I lose sleep over that? Yeah. Do I have some images in the back of my brain somewhere still to this day of horrible things happening to otherwise good people? Yes, I absolutely do. Um, and, and those are things I, I, I deal with in little chunks. And sometimes you have to put them in a box on the shelf, uh, not to get rid of them because they're always going to be there on the shelf. But sometimes to go to work, to do the things that we do, we have to put things in a box, set them on a shelf for a moment, do our job, and then come back, take that box down in little pieces and address them as we can. Um, we still have a job to do. That's very critically important. Um, and and we, we have to understand that the stress that we it, it, uh, allow ourselves to, to in, uh, come in contact with is, is not necessarily within our control. We have to grasp the things that are, bite them off in little bites that we can handle, and then set some aside for later, and then dump some on our friends at other times, because, um, you know, this isn't, this isn't normal, but we have to also understand this isn't the end of the world. Uh, and, and, and when you find the fulcrum in that balancing uh, act, Call me, let me know, because I'm always looking for new, for new ways of, of dealing with these things in my own life. And, and when you deal with this one, it will make you more resilient for the next one. So take these as, as not only stumbling blocks, but as stepping stones to where we're going to be uh, in two weeks or in six months. And, and picture that you are now more prepared to help your colleague or your friends through these things. Um, and, and if, we, if we take them on as, as that, as opposed to this unbelievable weight on our shoulders, I believe it's quite therapeutic. At least that, I'm, not, I'm, not a, I'm not in any way a clinician, but I, uh, I am a sufferer. And I find that when that happens uh, and when you, um, when you turn it into powers for good, you're in a better place overall. Thanks. Just wanted to share that. Brian, thanks for that. And it, it's, it, it reminds me that, that one way of looking at this, this is that as journalists, we, we try to control our environment. And we do that by equipment choice. We do that by the angles that we select. And this is simply another way of controlling our environment, of, of being aware, situationally aware, and, uh, <clears throat> and, and use that tool to help us deal with our emotions as well as everything else that we're addressing. Uh, and, and Brian, you're speaking up, reminded me, I want to tell everybody before we get over to Natalie and to uh, uh, Lauren that this will be posted on the uh, Earth Institute blog and I'll have a list of resources that will include a lot of good information in regard to this. Among them, a go bag. Uh, I'll have a link to one that I put together and a one that link that Brian has put together and this is the equipment you want when you're going out. So again, controlling your environment can help deal with that stress because it, it breaks it off into littler pieces. So with that, let me, if I could, Natalie, I see you out there. I don't see Lauren. I, I hope she's still with us, but let's, uh, let's talk a bit about uh, dealing with, there you are. Hi, Lauren. Dealing with uh, uh, editors. So, so Lauren, you dealt with uh, the contract with uh, Alex, right? Uh, do you have an order in which you want to talk or do you um. want to it's, it's up to the two of you. <laughs> um, I can talk quickly first and just say that, you know, most of what I do is sort of um, larger projects. And a lot of what I've been doing recently is just um, staying in really good communication with the photographers and checking in with them and sort of being the in-between between the editors who are assigning 
and the photographers to make sure that, you know, they're not taking on assignments they don't feel prepared for. And also trying to figure out what stories need to be told that can be told in a way where the photographers are feeling, you know, mentally and physically safe. So, you know, there, it's been interesting just to figure out, you know, what that looks like for each individual based on past experience, either working in war zones and feeling like that's something that is okay to go do right now and be out in the world or feeling like that's really not something that they're up for in terms of being, you know, out in the streets. So it's, we, we've been also just thinking about, you know, ways to tell stories, kind of like what Thomas was saying, you know, he's been doing a project with Zoom, but also just more personal moments and sort of intimate storytelling that our photographers have been um, doing an incredible job with is creating a body of work that maybe isn't what they would normally be shooting, but, you know, they've been, it's sort of shedding a light for the rest of us to see how they're experiencing the pandemic. Um, so with all that said, it's, you know, it's a lot of kind of, I guess, uh, conversations as Judith was talking about, just, you know, making sure you're checking in with people and that, you know, we're letting editors know who feels okay to be working and who doesn't and what that looks like in terms of the actual, you know, contracts or having those kind of conversations. Um, I haven't been having a lot of the day-to-day -day assignment talk. That's definitely something Natalie has been handling. Um, she worked with Alex on Vanity Fair. Um, we also had work published last week by Lorenzo that he shot for time, which was incredible. Um, so she, you know, she can speak to some of those conversations. Um, well, and I should have, I should have, I should have brought this up, and I'm sorry. I, I, forgive me for doing such a bad job of introducing the two of you. And your your editor is working, and you're in that unusual position of being the interface between the photographers and and the uh, magazines or other outlets who want to uh, have these assignments made, right? So you're sort of a buffer. So you're seeing from both ends. So what I hear you talking about, Lauren, is how to. Uh, uh, check in with photographers, make sure that they're functioning okay, make sure that they're, you're only assigning things that reach their capacity. Natalie, how about you? How about if you could talk briefly about the other direction, the, the, the direction of dealing with um, uh, editors and what their expectations have been and how well they understand or don't understand what photographers are going through? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, um... So, so like you said, I, I work um, in closely with the photographers and editors on assignments. Um, so I worked with Alex Maoli on that Vanity Fair shoot um, and like amongst other projects. Um, but basically I've heard a lot of information from editors about how they're choosing to handle this and how it's different from other assignments. Um, one thing that I think is really different is that typically an assignment will end when it, um, when the images are in and the the they've submitted their files, right? Um, I think in this case, it ends approximately two weeks after they finish shooting because um, there are still check-ins um, several weeks after someone goes off of assignment to make sure that the photographer is safe and healthy and um, that, you know, making sure that their health is really the priority in this situation. Um, so in that case, I think that's a bit different than typical assignments. Um, I also think that one thing editors are thinking a lot about when assigning is that, um, is why the photographers are wanting to cover this. Um, like, I think it's important for them to understand why someone's wanting to cover something and in what way. Um, and also whether there's someone who is equipped to handle that level of stress. Um, like if it's something they've done in the past and have um, experience with, or um, like how well the photographer knows themselves and make sure that they are like equipped to handle this emotionally. Um, and I also think that the editor photographer relationship is, you know, entirely based on trust also. Like I think both of them need to trust one another and like the, the editor needs to make sure that the photographer is someone who's 
going to take the precautions that they need to be taking. Um, and the photographer needs to make sure that the editor is going to sort of protect them and cover them and make sure that they care about their health care and that they're secure in those ways. So it's, it's a lot of a, a back and forth relationship that's pretty much built on trust from what I've experienced. And that's from your standpoint in dealing with photographers or from the people who are asking to commission? That's from commissioning clients. Um, yeah, I would say that's the feedback I've gotten from editors um, who are looking to assign. Um, I think that, you know, it's a lot of check-ins, it's a lot of communication, it's a lot of over-communication, making sure that you're um, from an editor standpoint, making sure that they're there for the photographer, like throughout the whole process. Um, and I think, you know, it might come off as annoying, but it's crucial um, to make sure that they they know that they are um, being represented well and being taken care of. Now, Magnum, of course, deals with with higher level. I don't know how to describe it, but but perhaps outlets that are uh, more aware, more engaged, more respectful of photographers. Um, I've heard many stories from photographers that, that don't find that to be the case. Have you heard similar stories, uh, Lauren or Natalie, either one of you from photographers of any clients outside of the, the Magnum world that, that have been more difficult. I mean, this is a really weird time, so hopefully not, but I'm just curious if you've experienced that or heard those stories. I mean, I think that's also like where our jobs actually step in, right, Lauren? It's like we have those initial conversations and make sure that they're thinking about the photographer's best interests because like our job is to ultimately like make sure our photographers are taken care of. Um, and so I think that's something that, you know, we sort of have up front with the editors as a conversation and, you know, say like, are you thinking, how are you handling these precautions? How are you going to make sure that our photographer is as safe as possible if they're going on assignment for you? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's basically our role to, if there is a situation that makes the photographer uncomfortable to step in and, mm -hmm. and fix it, um, and, and make it, you know, go away if that's what needs to happen. And. So, you know, there are publications that will reach out to photographers directly and photographers all have, you know, relationships with different editors and for different publications and sometimes they work directly. Um, but we always try to be that support and to make sure that whatever work they're being asked to do is something that they want to do. Um, and so, you know, we definitely pay attention to that and that's part of our role and just the you know, checking in and, and finding out about situations that might be making photographers feel uncomfortable. So for photographers listening who don't have the benefit of, uh, of your experience and your knowledge and your ability to work in these situations, do you have any advice for them on how to, uh, how to, what, what to look for and how to deal with editors, especially at a time like this? I mean, I think a lot of what Natalie was bringing up in terms of trust is really important. Um, I think there could also be just a gut reaction. You know, when you interact with someone for the first time, you kind of get a sense of if you think you can trust them and what that feels like. And I think just having really open, honest conversations with editors who you've never worked with before, just to put it all out on the table of, you know, what your past experience has been or what you feel comfortable with or don't and don't be afraid to ask questions um, and just be you know really thoughtful in the process and protect yourself so if anything makes you uncomfortable at any point you know either you can bring that up or you can just decide that maybe this isn't the right opportunity but I think it's just um, you know, as Judith was saying, just being mindful and, and taking care of yourself. So I think that goes into interactions with editors, thinking about stories and storytelling and how to, you know, start an assignment for the first time. Just kind of doing those check-ins to make sure that, you know, that gut check that this feels like the right thing to be doing. And if not, then, you know, you shouldn't be forcing yourself into a situation that isn't what you actually want to be doing in the end. I think it's also good to note that, um, like, I feel like a lot of photographers who 
maybe aren't as used to having those conversations with editors as we are or other photographers, um, it's important to really like prioritize your health and your safety and don't be like shy about speaking up if you're uncomfortable in a situation. Like I think it's really important to, you know, not take the assignment over your own health and your own comfort level. Um, and I don't think it's like a bad thing at all to speak up if, if you feel uncomfortable in a situation like Lauren said. So forgive me for an odd question. Um, and you may not want to answer this and that's okay. Uh, but this is, we're in an era of everyone's a photographer. <laughs> so assignments have been reduced for a lot of photographers out there because everybody has their mobile phone. Have you seen a, an increased awareness amongst editors of the value that professionals bring to the table? And might we see a renaissance in, uh, uh, in a desire for, for the skills that, that everyone on this the screen possesses? That's an interesting question. <laughs> um, I mean, I think there's definitely been um, a greater interest across the board from editors and clients and, you know, publications we don't work with as often because I think there is this sort of searching for how to tell these stories visually and, and you know, what photographers can offer right now. And I think some of the strongest storytelling has been the combination of the photographer's words alongside their images. What Nusha did for National Geographic, Lorenzo did the same thing for Time. Um, a lot of the work our photographers are creating right now, they're writing these diary entries and, and you know, journaling their experiences. And I think that combination of reading what is going through their minds and connecting through their words and also visually what they're seeing is incredibly powerful. So I think there might be maybe more focus on, you know, longer photo essays or, or different kinds of treatment where the photographers are given more of um, a voice text wise as well. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but you know, that's something that I've noticed and, and they're, we're having a lot more conversations um, than we were a few months ago with, with clients trying to figure out, you know, what to do in this moment. I think it's also, it also comes back down to that trust, right? It's like editors um, are like more inclined to, to work with photographers who have a little bit of experience um, in some of these areas. Like, you know what I mean? Like Lorenzo Maloney, for example, as Lauren mentioned, um, did this assignment with time. And that's something that he's had years of experience working in war zones and they're familiar with that. And it makes it like, you know, easier to assign versus like someone like you said, who maybe photography isn't necessarily their profession, but like something that they do. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that does have a lot to do with it as well. Okay, so we're gonna wrap up in a second, but if I could ask you, and we've touched on this and you guys should have been writing this down. Can we go through sort of a best practices list? Uh, Natalie, you did some of this already, but anything you think of that, that photographers, editors should be thinking about in these moments of, of what to expect in assigning, how to stay safe, all those things. What are, what are best practices uh, that could be given to editors? Um, I have one that's just a safety precaution for uh, like people in general. Like if you're working in a high risk situation, um, you should be very aware of the other people around you. Um, for example, if you're like going from one hospital to another hospital, like you wanna make sure that you're changing your outfit and cleaning before you go into someone else's space. Like I think it's, um, not only it's like a crucial courtesy, you need to be very respectful of the other people that you're entering their space um, in these circumstances. Um, and like one other thing I just recommend is to just make sure that you're being like a human first. Um, and like all these editors are also just humans, like everyone's wanting to support each other and like don't be afraid to just do what you need to do to make sure that you're safe first. As a former editor, you know, I've, I've never heard them described as human before. I <laughs> Lauren, anything to add? 
Um, I mean, I feel like everything's really been covered, but I think it's just all the same safety precautions and just being really mindful of your equipment and what you're bringing into other people's spaces. So if you are going into someone's home and photographing them and you feel comfortable in that situation, making sure that you've sanitize all of your equipment and yourself before going into that space and then you obviously do the same when you leave. Um, we do, we, we put together um, a couple of documents that I think photographers might find helpful to read that, you know, kind of highlights a lot of what has been discussed that, uh, Dale, I believe you're going to make public um, so everyone can, can kind of go through the points about, you know, how to talk to editors and some of the safety precautions that, you know, we think are necessary during this time. Um, and hopefully you can share links to some of the work we mentioned. I know you scrolled through Alex's story for Vanity Fair, but also Lorenzo's for time. And, and we'll share a few others that some of our photographers um, have had work published in Europe. Um, that's not as easy to see here. So we'll make sure that, that that's available as well. We'll put all that up uh, within probably two days on the Earth Institute blog. Uh, I want to thank all the photographers for being with us. I've got some quick boilerplate to go through, so if you can bear with me. But, but Nusha, Henri, Alex, Thomas, and uh, Brian, thank you so much for sharing so much of your valuable time. I, I greatly appreciate it and all your guidance for us. Uh, I thank you all for the wonderful discussion. Some additional information. Note that we will have that blog post up. It will contain more information and resources. We've got a lot of links and documents you want to go through. Uh, if anyone wants to share something with me they think would be appropriate to go up there, please do so. The post will be up in the next couple of days at the Earth Institute blog, State of the Planet. That address is blogs, B-L-O-G-S, dot E-I, dot Columbia, dot E-D-U. Again, it's blogs, dot E-I, for Earth Institute, dot Columbia, dot E-D-U. And you'll also be able to watch the video of today's talk there. Also, be sure to check out Andy Revkin's initiative on communication and sustainability at the Earth Institute. That's where you can read more about my program once we get our web pages up in a couple of weeks. We're brand new. While there, please look at some of our other posts. The ones linked to our initiative all have resources pages for journalists and may contain, many of them contain story ideas. So it's a great way to mine for ways of covering these most significant stories of our time. My thanks to Magnum Photos at magnumphotos.com and all they've done to make today's program possible, especially Amber Terranova. Magnum is an important resource for anyone interested in photography, including their classes, some of which I've taken. Also thanks to the National Press Photographers Association for their help. The membership costs are small, the benefits huge. Please check them out at nppa.org. And finally, to the Society of Environmental Journalists, my partners in so many things. It's my home. We talked about uh, finding your tribe. That's one of mine. If you're interested in environmental issues, it should be yours as well. So thank you all from, for sticking with us for such a long conversation. Thanks from the North Country of New York, and I hope you all have a wonderful week. Bye-bye now.